good, and we're so thankful. I'm going to ask Brother Dick Herman to come up here as we prepare to tra to transition our hearts to the Word of God. This man is a, a mighty man of God, and he, ha him, and his wife, his family, are missionaries over at Texas State University over in San Marcos. Marcos is or Marcus. Uh, Okay, they both work. Uh, just just north of New Braunfels, if you've been there, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's it's actually well, like I think it's actually considered like the party school, isn't it? Like one of the most party schools in the United States. I don't know, but um, it, it, they have a challenge on their hand because they're they're missionaries over there with Chi Alpha. He's going to tell you a little bit about what Chi Alpha is. He's going to bring a word. This is a powerful word, and I want you to listen to this word because this word is a challenging, uplifting, and encouraging word. A word that is going to help you better your walk with God and to know how to get involved as well. So after service, when he's finished, I'm going to come back up and I'm going to let you know how you as an individual can get involved with this ministry as well. But as we always do with our guest speaker, we love praying over him. So if you would extend your head, hand forward as we just begin to pray over him. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. I pray that every single nerve in his body will begin to calm down. And I begin to pray, Lord Jesus, that you will move through him. That every single word that is said will be your word, Lord God. That you have placed upon his heart to speak today, Lord God. I pray it will be challenging, uplifting, and encouraging to us all, Lord. God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will challenge us in a greater and mightier way that we can further the kingdom of God even here at Grace Bible Church, Lord Jesus. I thank you for this man. I thank you for what you're doing in his family's life, and I pray an abundant of blessings upon him, Lord God, and his ministry as you continue to open the floodgates and pour out your blessing in them and over them and through them, Lord God, as we see this next generation changed for you we thank you we love you we praise you in your mighty name we pray all God's people said amen amen, amen. can you give it up for Dick Herman thank you Lord thank you Lord Jesus well what an honor it is to be with you this morning don't you love your pastors Jacob and Charity aren't they awesome yes you know, I kind of wish that I was born with a perpetual triple shot cappuccino going through my veins like your pastor is. But um, anyway, what a, what a wonderful guy. We're excited to hear all the and see all the things that are taking place here at Grace Bible Church. And I wanted to get something to you just so you can up your swag. Uh, here's a little t-shirt for you, Pastor Jacob, so you can represent Chi Alpha as you're going out and about the community. And as people say, what is... Chai Alpia. What is that? So you can explain to them. So this is for you. Thank you. You bet. Um, as you can see, uh, I have two parts of my family that are not here today. Lisa and my daughter Emily. She's 11, a fifth grader. She's got the lead part in uh, the Christmas play at our home church that we attend in New Braunfels. And so they couldn't be here today but send their greetings So because uh, they have practices on Sunday mornings. But uh, they send their greetings your way. Hey, did you know you guys are divided into two camps this morning? You may or may not have known that. So let me ask you, how many of you here, um, after you got through October 31st, it was like Christmas decorations are going up? How many of you are Christmas decorations right off the bat? We're going to have two months of Christmas, all right? How many of you, it's against your religion to put any Christmas decorations up until the day after Thanksgiving? Let me see your hand. Okay, okay. So, yeah, it's kind of a mix. I know within our, within our campus ministry, we, we have them kind of in two camps there as well. I mean, as soon as the first cold snap came, people were pulling out their red and their green and getting all Christmassy. Um, in my mind, I would love to be the person that would already have my Christmas tree up and all that done, have my trees wrapped outside. But it's probably not going to happen until after Thanksgiving. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the, the second camp this year, most likely. So I'll join that club. But as Pastor Jacob mentioned, uh, we are missionaries to Texas State University. We're with a ministry called Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship. Chi Alpha is an organization that's been around almost 60 years. Actually, next year is its 60th birthday. And it is the Assembly God Fellowship 
years ago recognized the need to have a Christian representation on our university campuses and colleges around our, our nation. And so we're on almost 300 campuses uh, nationally. My wife and I arrived in San Marcos back in 2001 to pioneer the Chi Alpha ministry there at Texas State. So we just celebrated our 21st year there on campus. So we're so thrilled that the Lord has called us there, and we've seen so many generations of university students that have come through uh, this campus ministry. We're very, very blessed. You may say, what is Chi Alpha? Is that a Christian frat or sorority? If I had a quarter, every time I've been asked that, I would be a very rich man. We are not, but actually Chi Alpha uh, reminds us in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it tells us that we are Christ's ambassadors. And if you go back to the Greek when that was written, Christ's ambassador is, is Christo Apostoli. And so Chi is the first letter of Christo. Alpha is the first Greek letter of um, Apostle or Apostoli, of, of Christ's ambassadors. So that's a reminder to us of who we are on the university campus, that we are representatives of Jesus Christ to the university. And as any missionary that comes and fills this pulpit, visiting with you, I hope that they are passionate about their mission field as we are for our mission field. We believe we serve on one of the most strategic mission fields in the world today because our mission statement, as you can see on the screen, is to see students reconciled to Jesus Christ because we believe it'll, tra it'll transform the university but also the marketplace and the world. Why do I feel so passionate about university ministry? Well, number one, years ago we recognized that that Christian students were heading off to the university campus and many of them were stepping away from their faith in Christ. So we recognize that there needs to be a community where students uh, like coming out of your, your youth group will go off to the university campus and find like-minded classmates and they can not just survive spiritually but can flourish spiritually and lead their classmates to Jesus Christ. So we want to have a, a ministry where there is a Christian community and a safe haven for our Christian students. Also, did you know that in the United States, every year there's nearly a million international students to come to study on our American campuses. So we have an opportunity to reach hundreds of, of countries around the world as they send the cream of the crop from their cultures here to receive an American education we can reach students with the gospel and in turn send them back as missionaries to their homeland in positions of influence. Isn't that awesome? So great potential there. Obviously, on the university campus, students today are learning, but tomorrow they're going to be the leaders in helping to shape our culture. So if you look at the culture of today and you say, I don't know where this thing is going, then what we need to do is we need to reach the younger generation as you're doing here at Grace and at, at the university level through Chi Alpha and other campus ministries in order to introduce students who are going to become leaders to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the majority of students at Texas State University that we see passing by us in the quad are not followers of Jesus Christ, and they need to know. There was a girl in our, our group years ago, her name was Christina, and she came to Christ through one of our small group Bible studies. And when she was sharing her testimony, she made this statement that has stuck with me since. She says, I was lost, and I didn't even know that I was lost. So I wonder how many of the nearly 40,000 students at Texas State University are lost, but they don't know they're lost. They need to know that there's hope in the Savior of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we are there representing Jesus Christ your hands and your feet that are helping to take the gospel to Texas State University. So would you continue to lift us up in prayer? I would invite you after the service in your fellowship hall. We have a table there that has information on Chi Alpha, uh, ways to get a hold of us. If you know somebody or you're potentially heading to Texas State University, you know somebody that studies there or is heading that way, please let us know. We would love to be in contact with them and let them know um, that there's a place where they can find fellowship there in San Marcos. So and uh, there's also a, a, a form there. If you would like to receive our monthly newsletter, it's online, it's free, and uh, we would love to keep you up to date on what's happening with the ministry, how you can be praying for the ministry. It has a little section on, on there about our family. There's a student spotlight, so you get to meet one of our students every month. But be sure and place your information on that sign-up sheet at our table out there. But thank you so much. Um, for allowing us to come and just share this ministry with you. This fall semester has been 
really of the 21 years, one of our most fruitful fall kickoffs that we've ever had. Our, our, we've had more in attendance at our Tuesday night gatherings. We uh, new faces that are joining in our small group Bible studies. It's just an exciting time. And so we just invite people as you think about it, as you pray for us, Tuesday nights at 730, if you're eating dinner or whatever you're doing and you think of us, just whisper a prayer for our Tuesday night gathering that we have each week. But as I invite people to think of us and pray for us, uh, here's our biggest prayers. Number one, we pray for anointing because we recognize that we're involved in a ministry where it's, there's spiritual warfare that takes place. There are strongholds on the university campuses, not just in San Marcos, but all over, that the enemy has held onto for far too long. And we recognize that that can only be broken by the power of Jesus Christ. So would you pray for anointing upon us as we're involved in this spiritual tra- uh, trial as we are believing that light is going to press out the darkness on our university campuses. So pray for anointing. Pray for energy because uh, it's a, it's a, it keeps you busy. And tell you what, 18 to 22-year-olds, it seems like every year that gap between them and my wife's and my age gets larger and larger for some reason. I don't know why that is. But if you work with young people, you know, you got to have that energy, and you need that triple shot cappuccino every once in a while to keep going with them. But pray that the Lord will give us the endurance and the energy to do what he's called us to do. And the third thing that we always request prayer for, and this leads right into what we're going to look at this morning, pray for divine appointments. Because you say, what can we do on a campus of thousands and thousands of students? But I believe that every day God intends for us and our students to intersect paths with individuals that he wants them to speak with, to share hope with, to pray with, and to let them know that there's a God that loves them and has a plan and a purpose for their future. So pray for divine appointments. That's what we're going to look at. We're actually going to look at the life of a, of a man in the New Testament by the name of Philip. We read about him in a few of the chapters in the book of Acts, but I'm going to invite you to Um, Join me there. You're going to have some of the verses on the screen behind you. But if you have your physical Bible or your digital Bible, um, we're going to be looking in Acts. I'm actually going to introduce you to this individual by the name of Philip. We're going to be looking this morning at how Philip, you'll see the ministry that he was involved with. But our focus today is talking about the value of one. We're going to see that in the life of Philip, he valued the one. And I think God's word challenges us to do the same. Um, In the book of Acts, Acts 1, Jesus has risen from the dead. He has spent 40 days as a risen Lord, ministering to disciples, appearing to them for about 40 days. And in Acts 1, we see he gives some final instructions to his disciples before he ascends up into heaven. Acts 2, the Holy Spirit is outpoured. In, in a mighty way, and the church just starts bursting at the seams by the thousands. The church is growing. And logistically, with any organization that's growing, there's a lot of administrative stuff that needs to take place. And this was kind of distracting the disciples, those men that had walked and talked with Jesus for, for three years, um, took them away from their teaching and their discipling that they were doing in order to tend to some of the administrative stuff that could have easily been um, passed off to others. And so that's what's happening here in, in the very first part of Acts chapter 6. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect, neglect the ministry Um, of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom who will turn this responsibility and we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole group. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip and all these guys with funny names And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So we see here that 
there was some responsibility delegated to Philip and his six other co-workers to help with the daily distribution of food to the widows of that time. And then jumping over to chapter 8, we see that during this time between these, these chapters, again, the church was expanding. Um, in chapter 7, one of those individuals, Stephen, uh, made a stand, was very bold in his faith, and because of that, ended up giving his physical life. He became the very first Christian martyr that we see recorded in Scripture. That account is in chapter 7. And then in chapter 8, it says, um, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip, back to Philip, he went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all played, paid close attention to what he said. And with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. And so there was great joy in the city. So we see that Philip was appointed to this position to help in a very practical way in feeding the widows that were in need of that day. But we see also that along with that, he was greatly anointed. He was filled with the spirit and wisdom, as Scripture says. We see that miracles were being done, that healings were taking place, that people were, that evil spirits were being cast out of folks. Now, if that were to take place on my campus, if I were to go out on campus and see some of these things taking place, don't you think that there would be a crowd that would gather? that there would be, by the hundreds probably, the school newspaper would be there. They would be wanting to interview and say, how are you doing this? Obviously, he had a flourishing ministry, not only ministering to the widows in a very practical way, but obviously the Spirit of God was moving in his life in great power. So we see that, that this was taking place, and yet we can see some lessons from the life of Philip that I think can we, we can apply directly to our lives this morning to help us to know, like him, how we can value the one. What do we mean by that? Well, first off, we can learn some lessons from Philip. Here's one thing, that he had spiritual sensitivity. Let's read later on in chapter 8, and I want you to see how that takes place. In verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that leads down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shear was silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all of the towns until he reached Caesarea. I think one lesson we can learn about the life of Philip is that he was spiritually sensitive. We can see here that he had a conversation with an angel. I, I like to spend time in prayer, but I've never been visited by an angel. I don't know if, Pastor Jacob, you have or not. Maybe you're more spiritual than I. We're more worthy to be visited by an angel. But um, he had a conversation with an angel. So he received direct 
instructions from this angel on God's intended for him. But also we see here it says in verse 29 that the spirit told Philip to go to the road or go to that chariot and stay near it. See, Philip was connected enough with God's presence that when God spoke, he listened. And I think that's the case with us as well, that God is speaking constantly to us. The question is, are we listening? Are we putting ourselves in a position to where we can hear God's spirit uh, speaking to us on a daily basis? How do we do that? You need to be consistent with your spiritual disciplines. To be a person of prayer, just talk to God. How do I pray? You just have a conversation with God. You just talk to him. Be in the word. Find out what his truth is for you that day. So be regular in your devotions. Open up the word and see if God doesn't have something he wants to speak to you directly in the word that day. To spend time in worship like we have this morning, just times where you can get away, just shut out everything else and say, God, this is you and me time. And I just want to spend time with you in prayer. As you do these things, then your spiritual sensitivity is heightened. And when God speaks, I believe that we're going to be able to listen. I think one of the greatest influences that we have in the lives of university students is for them to know how to connect with the Lord. I think it would be a great disservice, and we would have failed as a campus ministry if we have students that go with us on mission trips and they're involved in leading small groups and they um, are involved with our worship team, they know how to run the computer or the soundboard, and they do all these things, and then they graduate after three or four years and they never really learned how to connect with Jesus. I think we would have failed them. So we need to connect with Jesus because we are spiritually sensitive. Um, Another thing we learned from the lessons of Philip is, number one, is he went to them. It says in verse 26 that he went went south to that road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, when uh, I've got one of my student leaders here, Christian, who uh, joined me on our trip today. And when we were leaving my driveway, we put the GPS in. It said 66 miles from my driveway right here on Main, to right here on Main Street. So 66 miles. Did you know that the dis- distance from Jerusalem to Gaza was a distance of about 50 miles? Now, we were blessed because we could get in the SUV and travel down here. It made it... Right, right at one hour. Now, we don't know Philip if he was on foot, if he was riding a mule, if he uh, rented a cart, how he was getting from there to there. But it says that along the way was when he made this encounter with this Ethiopian. It could have been a mile. It could have been in the 49th mile. But he pulled himself away from what was no doubt a thriving ministry in order for him to go and be with them. So, so Philip met this individual who is an influencer who is in high position there in Ethiopia. Kind of reminds me in Acts 1.8. You remember that verse where it says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witness is, witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, this wasn't Jerusalem, Judea, or Samaria, but we see here that the gospel is already being taken to the ends of the earth, Right? because he was ministering to this person from Ethiopia. I think we need to have our eyes open to the opportunities that the Lord is placing around us. They pass by us each day on campus, whether we be in the quad or in a cafeteria, students that are lonely, that are hurting, that are angry, that maybe are looking for Christian community. Maybe they've been abused or they're just too shy to reach out. Maybe they're walking in depression, whatever they may be. We need to go to them. We as God's representatives, as Christ's ambassadors, we need to take the gospel to them. And I'm thrilled to see when our students do that on the university campus, reaching out to classmates, letting them know that there's a God who loves them and has a plan for their life. And even beyond that, when we take mission trips, um, I love taking our university students on trips to other cultures to have them experience need represented around the world. Some of those students have grasped a hold of this truth to say, I want to go to them to the point where we have girls from our ministry right now. We have Ashley Garcia, who's serving as a missionary associate in Moldova. We have Abby Rigdon, who's serving 
over in Mongolia teaching school and ministering there. And we have a young lady from the Houston area, Ashley Hernandez, who actually flies out Thursday, four days from now, to go and work with Chi Alpha South Korea. So our students are going to them. Are we going to them as we learn from the life of Philip? Another lesson we see is that we need to meet a need. Verse 30 tells us that Philip ran up to this chariot. I love that, that verse because it suggests his body language, saying, I'm eager, I'm ready. God, I know that you called me. I know that there's a purpose for me being here, so I'm going to run up to that chariot as you've ex- instructed me to. It says the eunuch gave him an uh, invitation to come up into his chariot. One uh, translation says that he begged him to come up into that chariot and explain to him what he was reading. I think God takes the ordinary moments and can turn them into God moments. At your workplace, within your home, at the supermarket, wherever you are, you never know when God's going to take an ordinary moment and he's going to use that as a godly moment. I know at the end of the year, we wrap up our school year with the testimony night. It's an opportunity where, where I put down the microphone, my staff puts down the microphone, and we just let students share what Jesus did in their life that year. And it never ceases to amaze me that during that surface, service, it's usually the simplest things that took place that turned them on to considering Jesus or maybe visiting a Bible study or coming to worship with us on a Tuesday night. Maybe it was a simple text to say, hey, just want to let you know that I was thinking about you. Would love to have you come join us. It might have been them receiving an invitation to go to Waterburger after our Tuesday night gathering. And they're broke, as college students many times are. And a, a friend from the ministry says, hey, listen, don't worry, I've got you covered. And that meant so much to them that it helped propel them to get more involved and discover God's plan for their life. It's usually those simple things that we do that we think nothing of that turn ordinary moments into God moments. I think one day we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see individuals there and we're going to say, in essence, how did you get here? <laughs> then, and it'll be those simple things that'll say, this is a thing that let me know what true love was because those ordinary moments were turned into God moments. Another thing we see in the life of Philip was his tool was God's word. That's our tool. Our tool is the word of God to point people to the truth of who God says we are and what God says that we can do through him. You know, when we talk about presenting the gospel, gospel in the Greek is a word named ugelion, which simply means good news. So when we say that we're sharing the gospel, we are sharing good news. None of us like to come home and turn on the news and hear bad news. That's what it's many times populated with. But people like to hear good stories. They want to hear things that are going to encourage and uplift. And that's what we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have an opportunity to share with those around us the good news of who Jesus is. We have a saying that we use many times in Chi Alpha that simply says, love finds a need and meets it. That's one thing we need to really register this morning, that love finds a need and meets it, which is why I'm I'm so proud of this, this church here in Lytle taking the gospel in practical ways during this Thanksgiving season to those who have need because love finds a need and it meets it. You know, it's just, it's just amazing. The simple things we do can leave the biggest impressions about who Jesus Christ is. And our tool is God's word. In 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, it says this, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in other words, the word of God is what you need for every moment of every day. So don't be afraid to take our tool, that gospel, that good news to those who are your coworkers, to those who are your family members, wherever you're out in this community. Take the good news because it is our tool. It is God, God's word. When we take students with us on missions excursions, I tell them there are two things, as you're sharing your faith, there are two things that people really can't argue with. Number one is your testimony. Because you know where you were, you know how you encountered Jesus Christ, and you know where you are now and living in the fruit of his spirit at work within your life. So don't be afraid to share your story because they can't argue with that. You know your story. 
And I say the second thing you shouldn't be afraid about sharing is God's word. Because God's word is not going to return void, is it? So when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is our tool, as we saw here in the story of Philip with the Ethiopian. And finally, we see something we can learn from Philip is that our mission continues. Look back there in verse number 39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. But uh, the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, decided that he had a busy week, so he rented an Airbnb and just chilled for a season, right? No, it says that he traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So we can see this just wasn't a one-time mission for Philip, but he understood the value of one and that he was going to be passing through all these cities on his way back home. And so he continued to preach the gospel everywhere that he went. I pray that I might live my life with the same zeal that Philip has that says, God, as I go out and about my responsibilities this day, may I go with a godly purpose and a zeal that says, God, who do you have for me today? Who's that one that you want me to value today? that I can reach out to, that I can share the good news with, that I can maybe meet a need if the Lord enables me, whether it be on campus or at home or in the workplace, here at the church. You know, much of the fruit that we see within university ministry leaves our doors every spring. They graduate, sadly enough, which means that ministry continues year after year because we have a new crop of freshmen that come to campus. I think we had about 7,000 new freshmen that came to Texas State this fall semester. So our mission field continues to grow and flourish with opportunities for us to continue to walk in that mission. So we can see in the life of Philip that he was spiritually sensitive, that, that he went to them, that he met a need, that he shared the truth of the gospel, and his mission continued. So what's our step this morning. I want to lead us in a prayer, but maybe this is you this morning. Are you taking time to hear what God is saying to you at your workplace? God is speaking to you. Are you taking time to hear what he's saying to you at your workplace? Is there a neighbor that needs to be loved by this church body? I'm thrilled that these chairs are filling up, but you know what? They can put more chairs here. They can go to a third service. There's a creative way that we can get more people in a community like this that is going to learn that Jesus loves them. So is there somebody in your neighborhood that needs to be sitting in one of these empty chairs here this morning? Are you hearing God's voice in the midst of the noise? In the midst of all the busyness around you, are you sensitive to what the Spirit is saying directly to you? Because He's talking to you. Are you letting your dollars go to equip those in places where you can't get to? Supporting missions, doing things for the kingdom's sake. As God blesses you, be a blessing to others. Are you daily looking to meet the needs of those around you? Saying, God, I've been blessed, so how can I help those around me? Is there somebody that lives near me? Somebody that works near me, that has a need that I can be a practical blessing to? Are you in the word of God daily so that as that truth invades your spirit, you're going to be ready at a moment's notice like Philip was to say, oh, this is what God's word says. Or here's something I found in my devotions this, just this morning that really relates to what we're talking about today. Have you, seen, have you had those moments where it's like what I read this morning applied to the conversation I had later that day? It's cool how the Lord just orchestrates that. So be in the word daily. And may we not pass by pass the responsibility others to others because we are called. Like Philip, we live with that zeal and that vision saying, God, make a difference in and through me wherever I go. Divine appointment to divine appointment to divine appointment. God, use me. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Dear Lord Jesus, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the life of Philip, Lord, that inspires us Lord, to want to value the individual. Here he was moving in power. You're doing miraculous things, probably crusade-like services with evil spirits being cast out and miracles and healings. Hundreds of people, no doubt, gathered. But God, you said, I want you to go away and walk down this road 
and I'll give you instructions. And we see that he valued the one. When he had other things going, God, he valued the one. God, help us to do the same this week, Lord God, as we as we leave these church doors, help us to live with the purpose saying, God, who is it today? When I'm out to eat after service, who is it that I can be a blessing to? Who is it, Lord, this afternoon while I'm shopping? Who is it when we're at school? Who is it at the workplace? Lord, may I value the one because you valued the one. Lord Jesus, we ask all these things and I pray this over this congregation in your name. Amen. Amen. In first service, we had Christian come up and share something. And I'm going to ask, if it's okay with you, I would love for you to come and share a little bit of your testimony. He shared this in first service. I think it's absolutely powerful of a life that is that has gone through this ministry and the effects that it can have, not just being there, but helping them through and finding their where God's taking them. If you would, Christian, why did you share that with us? Good morning, church. My name is Christian. Um, yeah, I'd like to share my testimony. That's all right. <laughs> cool. um, for me, uh, growing up, um, my parents and I, we were what you call holiday Christians. So we were there at church only on Easter and then Christmas. But besides that, we were not anywhere near a church. Um, and around when I was 10, one of my cousins started inviting us to one of her churches, or her church. Um, and so she was just hounding my parents for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they finally were like, well, if we just say yes and go for one time, she'll finally stop asking us and we'll be done with that. So they ended up going. Um, and it was hard at first. Uh, we got there. Uh, I was very shy growing up. Uh, so for me, to, for my parents to be in service and for me to be in elementary with my siblings alone. There were some tears involved, so yeah, it was a little hard. But I ended up loving kids' church. It was such a blessing to me. Um, they were so welcoming. The lessons were just applicable to me as a 10-year-old. Uh, and then the worship and then all the games and the crafts that they had were just so enjoyable. And so as my parents came to pick us up after service, uh, we were telling them all that had happened during the day and then they, we were telling them what was going to happen next week. And I remember my dad's head snapped at my mom in that moment. He was like, yeah, we, we weren't planning on coming back. <laughs> but we ended up going back the next Sunday and then the next Sunday and next Sunday. And on and on and on, we just ended up getting more involved. And then over the next few months and the next year, my parents got saved. And for me, my journey was a little bit longer than that. Um, when I was 13, so when I was 10, we started going there. And for the next three years... I was learning about Christ, learning what he was or who he is. Um, and finally, uh, at a kid's camp when I was 13, uh, my great mentor and friend, whose name was Brother Pete, came up to me and told me, are you ready to accept Jesus as the Lord of your life? And so in that moment, I paused and I thought, man, do I really want Jesus as the Lord of my life? Do I really want that authority figure uh, over me? And I realized, man, Jesus loves me. He's a good God, and yes, I do want him, because he's a good authority. He's not going to abuse his power over my life. He, he loves me. And so I said yes. And then, after I prayed that prayer and accept Jesus, um, he asked me, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? And I said yes. And so um, he had gathered uh, the men that were there, and then the kids pastor, and they all laid hands on me and began to pray. And immediately felt the spirit it was the best way to explain it uh, was like a warm fire just all over my body and so as I was praying and as they were praying all I could do was just say Jesus thank you thank you Jesus as my knees began to buckle and I fell to the ground and I was laying there on the ground just praying thank you Jesus for what you've done uh, I felt him uh, call me to the ministry uh, and so I got up from there and I began to continue to pray this time it was a bit different. <laughs> I was uttering words, but I couldn't understand them. I was speaking in tongues. Um, and so after that, um, the kids pastor came up to me and said, I have a vision for you. And he said, I see you speaking all over the world to many uh, nations um, over your life. 
And so from that point on, that's what I've been pursuing. Uh, the Lord has yet to stop giving me opportunities to do that. Um, and so after that, um, he, uh, I started, uh, my parents were called to plant a church with one of the pastors that was there. So we joined them with that and sort of for the past seven years, that's what I've been doing. I've been very involved with them, with the elementary, the kids and the young adults. And they've even allowed me to preach several times. And then more recently, I got plugged into Chi Alpha and then to a church in San Marcos called New Life. I felt the Lord calling me to do uh, an internship. And so I asked Pastor Dick, hey, you know of anybody? And so he said, yes, there's a church. Um, they are former Chi Alphians. And so I uh, went with them. And that was a little hard because I'm stepping away from my parents and that, um, that security of being with them stretched my wings out, but it was good. And so um, even more recently, I felt the Lord call me to pursue uh, Chi Alpha full time now. And so that's my journey so far. And if I could share just one thing that the Lord has taught me over this time is obedience. And then the biggest lesson through that, which I've had to repent of many times, is that slow obedience is disobedience. So when the Lord calls you to do something, act on it as soon as it is. So, yes, thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. A powerful testimony. Touching and reaching lives. The importance of getting your kids in kids' church, even when they're screaming and yelling. They might not like it at first, but it can minister to them, as we see in Christian's life getting involved in the church, helping see what the church is about, getting plugged in with Chi Alpha to help guide you as a young man that's flapping your wings without your parents there by your side. All of those steps take place. And I'm gonna ask the ushers to come forward. A way that we can help this mission, Dick and Lisa Herman, over at Texas State is number one, praying for them. They have a table that's set up right in the back in the Midway area that you can go and you can say hello to them, let them know you're praying, get a prayer card. And we know number, number one is prayer. We need prayer. We need prayer to fight. We need fighting warriors to fight behind the scenes in the supernatural. But we also know it's hard to do things without any money as well. And we wanna help them further the kingdom of God, even in those 7,000 new students coming through. By this little bit, we can reach just a little bit further. And so I wanna take up a love offering that's gonna bless uh, the Herman family in their ministry. And so if you would give, that'd be great. I know they would love that and it would be a blessing to them. If you give by check, you can make it out to Grace Bible Church and put on the envelope that it's a love offering towards them because we want to make sure it goes towards them. We're going to take it all and make one check to them. That way they're not getting a bunch of little things. So we're going to give them one big check to just bless them with. And if you want to give online, you'll see in the drop down box that you can also give online through the love offering. And just a reminder, the Kingdom Builders, this is what it helps with. It allows us to enable us to further our finances to support Dick and Lisa Herman on a monthly basis. So by you saying, I wanna go above and beyond my offering or my tithing and give an offering to Kingdom Builders, it helps us and enables us to be able to say, yes, we wanna take you on and bless you monthly. And so we encourage you, if you don't do that, to do that, to pick up the baton and to be able to further your reach and put your full trust in God that he will meet every single need. Just listen to him and act in obedience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us, Lord Jesus, to be a steward of the finances that you have given us, Lord God, so that we may be obedient to you and to show you that we are wanting to be obedient to you, Lord God.
Lord God, I pray that you will speak to every individual here, Lord God. I pray that you will challenge their hearts, Lord God, in an amount that you should, that they should give, Lord Jesus, to bless the Herman family, to further their reach, to take one more, to talk to one more student, to get one more student to go on a mission trip, to change one more life, to further their reach, Lord God. Let us be a part of what you are doing right here in our colleges, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, and through the obedience, I pray, Lord God, that you will bless and bless and bless and pour out your blessing upon. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in your mighty name we pray. Amen. If ushers, if you would, receive. If you need an envelope, they have one you can ask them for, and they will make sure to give you one as well. Brother Albert, there's people over here. You're like looking at me. You need to look at them. <laughs> God bless you. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Were you blessed by today's sermon? Were you challenged, equipped, ready to do more for the kingdom of God to further our reach? God's going to do some great and mighty things. Can we all stand? Lord God, we thank you for today. May we go out and find the one, the one that you were calling us to, to give our testimony to, to find the one and be able to share our testimony and share the love that you have showed us. We thank you, Lord God, as we go throughout our day. Let us never forget the love you showed us so we may extend our hand to share that love. We thank you. In your mighty name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Please stop at the table. He will be there to give you those prayer cards. God bless you.